In the US, we rely on the government for a lot. We trust the people we elect to keep roofs over our heads, food on our plates, and our country humming along without veering into dictatorship, nuclear war, or in the case of the economy, a brutal recession. We literally hire them with our votes to spoil us with public schools, infrastructure spending, and benefits like child tax credits. Just don't ask them for nationalized healthcare or affordable college tuition. The thing is, that money the government uses to help fund our civilian lives has to come from somewhere. And that somewhere is pretty much always us, the very people they're spending on in the first place. Hi, I'm Matt Sofa, and this is Study Hall Macroeconomics. If you've been keeping up with this series, you know we've talked a fair bit about how the government uses fiscal policy or taxation and spending laws to affect the overall health of the economy. When we experience the rising price levels of inflation, the government can use contractionary policy like raising taxes to slow things down. But much more commonly, the government wants to heat the economy up to head off a painful recession. When the economy is stagnant, a government can use expansionary policies like spending on big projects or providing transfer payments to boost or stimulate the economy and make sure all of us can afford our luxurious lifestyles of feeding our families. But when the government is able to boost the economy by dropping those dollars, the financing for that spending has to come from somewhere. There are three main ways that government spending is financed. Taxation, government issues of debt, and government issued money. Taxes are probably the most familiar way to fund all the spending the government does. The money the government siphons off of your paycheck can go to funding projects that create jobs, boosting employment, production, and GDP, particularly when the economy is edging towards a recession. Your tax money might also be invested in research projects or education, which can grow our economy in the future by increasing potential GDP or how much our economy could possibly produce. But the government's tax revenue doesn't only come from your paycheck. Both states and the federal government can also pull in money through property taxes, sales tax, or excise taxes on products like alcohol or tobacco. Many European countries also have a VAT on goods at each stage of production. Another way the government pads its wallet is through borrowing money from both people and other countries by selling bonds. These are essentially IOUs paid back with interest when they expire. Finally, if you're the government and you need some extra spending cash, you can always go ahead and print it yourself. They can then sell these crisp Benjamins to the market at face value, which is, you guessed it, way more than it costs to produce, meaning it makes some pretty profit for the government. It all boils down to a simple budget constraint. You can't spend money you don't have, even if you're a government. So spending must equal taxes plus issuing debt plus printing money. This means in order to spend anything on all of us, the government has no choice but to implement some combo of all three. But while we may love the results of all that spending, taxation, government debt, and money creation all have some potential drawbacks for the people of the country, the government itself, and for the economy. Take taxes. While nobody loves seeing a chunk of their hard-earned paycheck snatched out of their hands, the sane among us agree that it's a small price to pay for public goods like schools, libraries, parks, museums, social security benefits, infrastructure projects, and all that other good stuff. But beyond our temporary whining, higher taxes can affect the entire economy by cutting into a household's spendable income. See, if the government raises income taxes, Consumers will have a smaller take-home paycheck to spend on stuff like breakfast burritos and garden gnomes. And taxes on households' investments might reduce their incentive to invest in the first place. This decreases the funds available to loan out to other people to borrow and spend on things like a new house, an adult-sized ball pit, or the creation of a new business, like Sofa's Surf Shack or Matt's Magic Barbecue Blue Cheese Salad Dressing. And this would drop spending even more, theoretically decreasing GDP. Now, there's a lot of debate about just how much higher taxes affects households' behavior, but we do know people make life choices based on income and taxes. And it's not just about how much to spend or save, but 
how much to work too. If your paycheck is whittled way down thanks to taxes, it may actually make more sense for you to cut back on your work hours and stay home to do things like take care of your kids instead of paying for childcare. In that case, employment would drop, which could drop GDP too. And on the business side, higher taxes can also reduce spending and investment. It's the same dealio as with households. Higher taxes means less profit, which means less to invest back into the business. This could mean lower paychecks and fewer luxury yachts and second island homes for those folks in the corner office. But much more often ends up looking like cutting jobs and putting off the purchase of new technologies. Of course, like we've already established, some taxation is necessary because some government spending is necessary too. And when used just right, Higher taxes and government spending really can help grow the economy in both the short and long run. So the government has to find that sweet spot between taxing so much it slows down the economy and taxing just enough to meet the needs of the nation without going overboard. And the solution to this problem is funnier than you might think. The Laffer curve shows the theoretical relationship between tax rates and actual revenue for the government. It's named after Arthur Laffer, who developed the theory in 1974. And by developed, I mean ripped it off after reading about it in a book by 14th century Arab social theorist Ibn Khaldun. And our good friend John Maynard Keynes wrote about pretty much the same principle in the 1930s. The Laffer curve is really just your basic bell curve, where we see tax rate on the x-axis and tax revenue on the y-axis. The first half of the graph makes sense. Of course, the more government taxes, the more tax revenue they're gonna take in to reinvest in the nation. But then something funny happens. According to this theory, at a certain point, the tax rate hits a tipping point where the government is taking so much from people's paychecks that they decide to just stop working, which means less money to tax and less revenue for the government. And for the people who do keep working, eventually they'd be so taxed that they wouldn't have any money left to spend in the market anyway. If you follow this theory, the peak of the Laffer curve tells us how much is too much when it comes to taxes. It's the point where the tax rate will make the most revenue for the government. The Laffer curve was the basis for US President Ronald Reagan's 1980s economic policies, known as Reaganomics. Also known as trickle-down economics, the general idea is that by cutting taxes for businesses and the super wealthy, these folks would be more likely to A, actually pay up rather than evading their rate, which results in no income for the government, B, up spending and production to invigorate the economy, and C, use all their extra money to create jobs and up pay for workers, increasing economic prosperity for everyone. Needless to say, there is a lot of debate about exactly where the government should set taxes to reap the benefits of government spending versus loss of private output. And some economists believe trickle-down economics has it totally backwards. They argue we should be taxing the highest earners more to help fund those government services, so everyone pays closer to their fair share based on their income. Luckily for the government, it doesn't have to rely totally on taxation to reel in the green. Like I mentioned before, the government itself can go into debt, borrowing money just like you and me. The consequence here is, of course, debt. The government doesn't have to pay off its debt in our lifetimes, but it does have to pay back individual lenders, which requires borrowing more to pay back that original amount, plus interest. It's a matter of robbing Peter to pay Paul, if you will. Future generations end up paying for what the government borrows now. Also. Watching the national debt rise can lead to some pretty sketchy effects on things like the stock market and private investments. One big issue with government borrowing is it can crowd out private investment, meaning that people who would otherwise invest in private businesses are giving their money to the government instead. And while the debt ceiling is technically flexible, there can be some pretty dire situations if a government borrows more than it can ever hope to pay back. Just look at Greece. Following the financial crisis in 2007, the country found itself in so much debt, it actually had to be bailed out by various private institutions, but not before its whole economy totally tanked. So when it comes to debt, things aren't so different than with taxation. It's good for the government to go into some debt, but not so much debt that it starts to affect the economy in other ways. The last revenue source is printing currency, but 
as you can guess, Xeroxing sheet after sheet of dollar bills has its own potential drawbacks too. The revenue the government rakes in by printing money for a few cents and then selling it to the market for however much that particular bill is worth is known as seniorage and it can be a quick path to bumping up the government's funds. But just like too much debt or too many taxes, seniorage isn't the magic bullet to funding government spending either. If a government prints too much money, it can lead to inflation. You know, one of those things the government was trying to mitigate by taxing and spending to begin with. Overprinting money is in part what got Evita Peron and the Argentine government and economy in so much trouble in the mid 20th century. Argentina didn't just cry for her, they cried because of runaway inflation. And even low inflation, like the US target rate of 2%, has some costs. It erodes the purchasing power of the money you have in your pockets, called the inflation tax. In some ways, this can have the same end result as other kinds of taxes, leading households to cut back on their spending. When the government raises taxes, your actual paycheck might look smaller, but with inflation, even if the number on the line looks the same, it's worth less in purchasing power. And less purchasing power means less purchasing, which means less GDP. So there is no real costless way for the government to raise the money it needs to spoil us with those basic necessities. As with everything else, each of these options is a trade-off. And no matter how the government collects its funds, they're all coming from more or less the same place, our own pockets, be it through taxes, borrowing, or the price of inflation. And since we're the ones giving the government its much needed funding, maybe it's time we start asking for some other itty bitty favors in return. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full study hall macroeconomics course and earning college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like, comment what you wish the government would spend your taxes on, and smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. See you next time.